Hello and welcome to another episode of Throttle Stop Garage. In today's episode we're going to have a look at how we can take a piece of stainless steel, an air riveter and some homemade tooling and we're going to see if we can make some stainless steel trim for our project car. Stay tuned. Okay, so if you joined us for part one of making stainless steel trim, then you will have seen that we made the metal die and we mounted it onto some wood. We used a little bit of long strand uh, kitty hair style bondo. And we set in our stainless steel blank and we used our air riveter to get this formed with some tooling that I made. Uh, and then a bunch of stuff broke. So it turned out that um, this is just a little bit soft to stretch the stainless steel enough. I've gone off to my local plasma table person again all right so it's uh, i can't get water jet done uh, apparently there's a new laser table in town or at least near town so i can do that but in the interim i've drawn up in essence exactly what i did before so i've drawn up a clamp i've drawn up the main die and i have a base plate but this time all in steel and while i was at it i had them knock out some blanks for me so this is all going to bolt together now same technique as last time. We're going to take the wooden trim piece that we made, wax it. We're gonna use a little bit of that Bondo long strand and short strand filler, same technique as before. There was nothing wrong with that part of the technique and we'll see if we can get this part made. Right, if you didn't tune in last time again, I don't have this piece of trim. I have the piece of trim. It's just in my garage somewhere. I have no idea where. I took it off the car uh, 16 years ago. It's gone, no clue. Anyway, that's what it should look like, or at least close enough. And we're going to make that piece of trim coming right up. Okay, so one of the issues with the plasma cut parts, the thicker parts, uh, no problem, actually reasonably good holes, uh, pretty clean edges, not much to clean up on the part. I've already buffed these a little bit, but you can see the quality of the cut pretty evident here. Now it's a lot better than plasma used to be, right? So this I'm gonna just take and hit it with the belt sander and tidy that edge up, but it's not gonna take much in order to have that nice. One clamp, two of those die parts. The other advantage of plasma is it's dead cheap. The, the stainless steel parts did have rather a large bit of flash on them, sort of some spit back and some other things. So I wouldn't recommend that as a cutting method if you had to be close. We don't really have to be close to the edge. So none of that is gonna, you know, this isn't gonna cause a problem for any of the parts that we're gonna make. And I've got both 22 gauge cut as well as a bunch of blanks cut in 20 gauge. The reason I had so many done, uh, why not? What if I wreck a bunch? Who cares? Once you're, once you got the plasma table up and it's at your beck and call, uh, the parts aren't actually all that expensive relative to the start cost of just getting the job running. Right, so we get going just by threading the holes. So the other holes were cut oversized and I had these holes spec so they'd be about the right size to run a tap straight into them. It worked fine. They're not a perfectly threaded hole. It doesn't need to be. This was good enough. Uh, then I clamped them both together because they do have to fit rather precisely. The Both halves of this uh, setup have to join. Like the two stainless steel halves have to join together relatively perfectly. So I didn't think it was going to be good enough to just simply, you know, remove the flash off of it. So I went to the land of frustration and managed to get, you know, both the two parts together. Uh, grind and sand them. So the grinder at first just to level it out, right? Just to get both parts straight. The There is a wander to the kerf on any plasma and then over to the belt sander, knock that stuff down. I'm never happy with a purely sanded finish. So. so I get the file out and I make sure that it's actually square and flat and fits that wooden part as perfectly as I can make it fit. It took an evening. It's relaxing. What can I say? So at the end of that, then I am confident that those two parts are accurately fitted.
So with that job done, I now turn around and I chamfer all the corners, which is sort of necessary to do on most of these uh, plasma cut parts. And I bought one of those little tools. They have a carbide bit on them. They're kind of like a little router, but you can just plunge them straight into steel. And uh, I used to just hand file all my edges and corners, and I don't miss hand filing all my edges and corners now that I have that particular tool. It works great. The first step before the bondle goes on is to apply a bit of actual release wax to this wooden part. As with all of this release wax, we don't actually want to wait for all that long before we wipe it off. I went in for lunch, but as it chalks up pretty good, it's not like regular car wax. Don't use that. The next step is to remove all of the mill scale off of the steel where the bondo is going to get applied. I'm not 100% convinced that this is a completely necessary step, but just making sure the bondo's got some good tooth. We are going to be hitting this with an air riveter, so I don't see any reason why you'd try to do less than the best that you could do in order to get that surface prepped uh, nice and clean with some reasonable tooth uh, to have that happen. Next up, welder up. Just tack it in place and uh, we're ready to go. All right, so with the parts tacked in, I just, well, it gave them little fingers. That's all it needs for a weld. Remember to chamfer the right holes. I just don't want edges and things. I know it's anal, but that's fine. I need that edge sharp, okay? I need this edge on the top of the die to be sharp. Then I just re-double checked my fitment from before, I think you can get the idea here. Okay, so the idea is that, that the die basically has to fit as perfectly as it can to the wood, because we want the top edge of that die to do work. We just need the, in this case, I'm using Bondo hair Check the other video. This is what was on sale. It doesn't matter. You can use the short strand as well. Uh, I had good luck the first go around. I've got no great experience doing this, so I can't say what works and what doesn't, but this did work. We've got everything waxed up. We're just going to set it into a bed of it. And we're going to see how it goes. Don't forget to mix that long strand filler up really well. It's it's actually hard to do. And when you go to put the hardener in, try to spread it out. The, that's your top tip. Just spread it out as wide as you can because it actually makes mixing it a lot easier. And then, yeah, what a what a god-awful mess. You just sluk this mess into there. I won't even comment on what that looks like. But uh, And then you set the part in. And then I would sort of push and trim until the part was registered against the back of that metal die tight. Try to clean up as much as I can so I'm not sanding. No one likes sanding. This stuff can all be moved pretty easily when it's just in, in this state. It's more or less like carving. Um, and not something that's super hard, like something that's reasonably soft. Make sure it's not locked in. So you can see it's not hard, hard, right? It's right about the right level. I didn't even, it shouldn't be popping. It should just be releasing. Nice. Okay. So that's left us with a pretty good surface here. You can see, hopefully, and we'll have to clean again. We're going to clean that off. Go again on the other half. Uh, without all the talking, but you can see it's left a pretty reasonable surface in there. Once we've got this cleaned up, there's bound to be the odd. I was having some issue with this back corner. We're going to have to cut. Again, some of this can be done like right, right now. Well, it's easy. You can just use that top line, right? Slide the razor blade over into it and then just trim it out. We also want to make sure that none of the angles that we have in here are going to lock. Like this is obviously going, you know, it's going around a corner here, so we can take that off. Um, again, super easy to do at this point. It's a pain to do once this is hardened. Once it's fully cured, it gets quite hard. So we'll have to come in with a little bit of the short strand filler just to smooth it out, but I'm pretty happy with that. 
we'll take it. Okay, one down. Let's clean it up. Uh, get everything ready to go. Do the other half. Um, then I'm going to watch the hockey game. The heck with you. <laughs> we'll see you tomorrow. Okay, just like last time, we're at the green stage. Okay, got a nice release. Good. That part came a little cleaner than last time, I think. Now we're at the moment of truth where we're going to bolt in that first stainless steel plate. You can see I've got the air riveter ready to go, the Delrin head in it. This is all homemade stuff. And the rebuilt tooling. So I broke that other tooling that I used in part number one, uh, pretty successfully broke it. Then I actually proceeded to break this five more times. I changed the design subtly each and every time. Truthfully, as long as the stainless steel is up and away from the bottom of the die, I don't seem to really have any problem. Like the tool's not getting hot. There's no other real issues. Yeah, okay, so we're hitting it. I think the problem comes once you start getting tight, once it starts getting down tighter to the mold, because the impacts don't have anywhere to go other than into the tool, so it breaks. You can also see that front edge flexing quite a bit, which was causing me not concern more than anything else, not a real problem. And I've got a number of heads for the Delrin so, or, or that I made, so I change them out to sort of suit the shape, and there, I broke it again. Well, the tool lasted all of uh, 10 minutes. I think the problem here actually is, and, and it's Sunday, so there's no way for me to get any of this fixed or remachined or any of that kind of stuff. Uh, I think the problem is just there's your weak point. So you got a whole lot of force coming in on this. This is going to weeble wobble around just a little bit, sort of like a valve and a head if you like. So all I'm going to do is grind it off. It's Sunday. I have no other choice. Grind it off and I'm going to put a really big fillet. So I just use the typical fillet that I would for any kind of MIG or TIG welded part, not a MIG welded part. So it's a pretty small fillet, and I just don't think it gave enough stability between the hammery bit and the other end. Okay, so we're gonna just weld that back in. We got the positioner back up on the bench. Now that I'm working out how to use the thing, I can get it to operate. It's just, it's me, I'm the problem. So uh, it's hard, it's one more variable. For anyone who's never TIG welded before, uh, TIG welding is kind of like playing the drums and add a positioner in, it's like uh, playing a really big drum kit. So you gotta get all kinds of things going. So we'll get this ground up, prepped, tacked up, welded, and hey, as long as I can get one part, we're just still working on the 22 gauge, it's going well, right? So what you saw at the end of the last video lapse was, hey, it's, it's going all right, everything's fine. We do have it doing this again. The actual trim fits is fine. I was not able to get the tight radius into this corner, right? So into this corner has been a problem. The tools just wouldn't do it. So I have a sharpened uh, brick chisel that I've used and I've rounded it over nicely, rounded off the sides a little. And I've just gone in and I'm whacking that in by hand. It's not perfect, it's a little savage. So I'm gonna see if I can get some other ways of doing this. So my finish isn't quite, again, I'm not too worried about the roughness of the finish. It's actually not too bad because when I'm done, this is the hammer that I use to ding out this stuff. It's a, it's a Picard hammer. If you've never used Picard hammers, buy Picard hammers. Uh, I only have the one. That and Sykes pick event make a really great hammer. But you have to refinish the faces. Everyone's doing a video on refinishing hammer faces right now. Wow, it's a hammer face, get over yourself. Uh, so I just round the edges off all the way around because any errant strike, you don't want it to leave a dent on your metal. And this is like a small flipper or a small flat planishing hammer. So you can use it to just very carefully. Now it's stainless steel, so very carefully on stainless steel means 
I'm hitting it rather aggressively, more aggressively than I would use on steel. Uh, and I was trying with the old green hammer, green hammer of doom, <laughs> to do the same. But yeah, refinish all your hammer faces. When my buddies come over to the shop, <laughs> one of them, not naming names, he always goes and grabs one of my body hammers and makes like he's going to hit a nail with it just to see my reaction, which is always negative. <laughs> don't do that. Anyway, don't touch my body hammers. Okay, so we're going to get rolling. We're going to get this stuff welded back up and we're not giving up anytime soon. So you can kind of see the way that that was working with the drill uh, hammer in a way to getting everything turned. And the speed wasn't too bad. It's it's trickier to do than it looks. So here's a, just a few arc shots of me doing this. Uh, you're all over me when I am got that camera. Like the camera's super close and <laughs> it's, it's taking something difficult and making it even worse. So I'm just, uh, you can even see there, I'm preferentially dabbing on the thicker parts of the metal, uh, trying to move it along, trying not to screw this up. And eventually I got satisfied to the point where I'm like, yeah, that positioner, it's going to work just fine for me into the future. Uh, yeah, I can't buy one anymore in Canada because Certiflat won't sell you one. But hey, I got lucky when they first released this thing. Okay, on to the next part. So we're continuing the adventure. I've now shortened the tool up just a little bit and put the big fillet on it, like I said. Don't worry, I'm still going to break it. There's no chance that I won't break this tool. It's, it's just a thing. I gave up on hammering into that corner. So now I'm just, I've got, you can see that sharpened Delrin point. And now I've decided that I'm just going to take whatever it's going to give me. I'm, I'm going to stop arguing with the steel. I don't want to be doing the metal refinishing. The radiuses are fine. I can get it tight enough that it looks just like the real part. So I'm a little bit, you know, settle down a little bit and I'll be just fine. So I keep testing against the wooden part. And then the flappiness of that front edge is completely settled down just by clamping the metal. And the issue there was I couldn't get it to planish properly. I couldn't get the hammer form to work right because it was always bouncing around. But if I clamped it down, I could easily work around the welding clamp there on that bench and get in behind it and get exactly where I wanted to clamp and make it nice and tight. So once I was finished, I decided to just give you a quick pan around and you can see, yeah, those look just about perfect. All right. Time to cut off the waste. Just hope I don't go too far. Stay in this last word. Okay, now for the tricky part, I've got to cut the top line. Happy enough with the bottom line, I've left, again, I've left a lot of margin here. I only need a little bit uh, down here, and yet as I come uh, closer to the sort of larger radius, then I just need a little bit off of that. So in order to do this, I'm going to try to sort of guesstimate where that line is. I'm going to use some uh, really cheap blue fine line. This is not the good stuff. Uh, but it will pull a nice straight line and I'll just use uh, tin snips and come in and cut that line out uh, being super careful trying to get it right. I'm going to deburr it first before I start in because the stainless has little there just little bits of stuff hanging up everywhere that are causing me to bleed. So let's get this line laid out and then get it cut off. Okay, so after I got it all cut off, I found that the top profile edge just wasn't quite right. It wasn't the same between both parts. So a little dolly on the sandbag and just uh, trying to, you know, you've got to get the fit almost perfect here. I know that the one back corner, as these parts are test parts, again, they're not the real part. This is the first time I've ever done this. Uh, so I'm just going to make sure that when I planish those parts, I try to get them fitting up as well as I can. Like they have to be just about perfect. There's no sense welding it if it's not perfect. If you can't get the fitment just right, no 
weld in the world is going to be able to recover a part like this. You will end up with way too much heat, a lot of distortion and other problems that viewers pointed out in the first video. So careful fitment's always the key. All right, so welding this stuff up is not easy. Uh, if you're not sort of seasoned at doing this, it's going to be tough. You can see as I'm going, even just getting it tacked, is uh, it has to be, again, the fit-up has to be perfect. So I got laid in the first couple of tacks, and then I was dollying out those uh, lines all the way along the back again, just to try to make sure everything is just as perfect as it can be. And you can see the purge line I've got installed in there. So I created a solid piece just out of some thickish aluminum uh, and put a diffuser in it. And that gets me a back purge and back purge stainless. It doesn't matter. I can't get to the back side of this weld to make sure that it's nice. Do not, I mean, yeah, it's, it's trim and somebody's going to tell me that, oh, it won't rust from the inside. It doesn't matter. Back purge stainless, just best practice. There's no point to not doing it. I lay in a lot of tacks. There's tacks probably every half inch. And then I'm going through laying in these very small little stringers along the way with the old 35 wire, which is hard to do. Uh, but at the end, hey, that's the inside. So shaping the final part next and we're all good to go. Right, so all I've done here is go over to the belt sander with an 80 grit belt on it and I'm just very, very careful. You can barely see a spark coming off of it. I'm very carefully knocking down the high spots on the weld and then checking through the area. Now you're going to find out later that I probably should have gone back in and welded a couple of the touch-up areas where I, I didn't underfill the weld, but what happens when you're welding the stainless is the puddle sinks in because you're, you're fully fusion welding it, right? It's going all the way around. Um, so a few of those areas, I just didn't know how far I could go sanding them out. There was one at the back end. Again, the material gets thinner, so it's a little hotter, so the puddle is going to sink a little bit quicker. Uh, and it's tough to do. So I'm just working my way through the grits, 80 grit at the start. I actually started with a file and then I worked through the 80 grit. And then as you're going through each one of the grits, so 80 and then 120 and then 240 and then 320, I'm only going in straight lines. So just recognize what I'm doing here. It's important to catch the detail. So I'm working in straight lines uh, because the sandpaper is cutting. Right, just the same as the file is cutting. The sandpaper is cutting through the material, so you're going to leave lots of little straight linear traces as you're going. And then at the very end, I'm going to come in and roll those. Not they're not sharp lines by any sense, but I don't think you can get a part straight if you're going to be sort of randomly haphazardly sanding this. So you can see when I break out with the fingers here at this point exactly, then I'm starting to roll off any of the very very subtle edges. So when I'm done sanding this, it looks like it's almost polished, which means it takes about four seconds on the buffing wheel to bring it up, and I find the quality is better. So there it is, all done. Okay, so here's the final trim on the car. Gotta be happy with that. So I'm gonna try to give you a look at it, but the lighting conditions in the garage here are actually pretty bad. They're nice for making parts, but they're not great for making videos. I do what I can. Anyway, you can see, there's barely a flaw on the part. There are a few. This was always a prototype. This was never going to be the finished part that was going to go on the car. There's a few little areas or one area on the back where I should have added a little bit more weld and didn't. And there are a few flaws along the backside edge here, which I tried to buff out. And again, this was the bottom part here on the part where I did have to go in and hammer it. So we have, it's not completely symmetrical, very close though, very like who's ever gonna notice, just me. Uh, I also don't have the mounting system in here yet, which is just a simple set of flat brackets with some nuts on the back uh, and a few we're gonna have studs that go through. Uh, so that's kind of boring. I don't need to show you that uh, to show you the finished product. So there you go. It's about as good as I think I can do, and it's certainly a lot better than the part that uh, Volvo will sell me that will fit on my car. Okay, so that's gonna be a wrap for this video. I'm happy with the process for making the part. I'm not happy with how I keep breaking the tools 
And uh, I have ordered a tool from Tin Man Tech, so hopefully that's going to come in the mail very soon because we got a few more of these little stupid projects coming up. Again, this is part of the project series, which is just this is the little stuff that will absolutely kill your project car. Like you go looking around for a piece of trim that you don't have, and, and yeah, I spent probably too much time and went into way too much detail to try to get the part made, but that's life. And I am going to make uh, another set of these, but in 20 gauge. This is 22 gauge. Um, no, no real reason other than it should just give me a little bit of extra polishing room to make sure that everything is just perfect. Um, as a learning piece, this was pretty good, pretty informative, and it is stunning if you see it in real life. So I'll just try to, I have no idea how I'm going to film this, but if you saw it, you'd have no idea I ever made that out of two parts. Like, it's just about perfect. It's so nice. Anyway, thanks a lot for coming along uh, on the video. Do you appreciate the, uh, the views that we get? Don't forget, give it a thumbs up, give it a like, subscribe if you want to keep in touch with all the content that I bring. Uh, and don't forget, uh, leave a comment below if you feel like it. I answer them all. It's just me. <laughs> anyway. Uh, thanks for tuning in. We'll catch you on the next episode. Keep your stick on the ice.